Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for these miracles. It is so exciting, God. It is so exciting. And I want to thank you, God, that through thick and thin, starting with myself and everyone here, God, I know there are some powerful testimonies, heart-wrenching events in our lives, God. Everyone here knows in their heart what I'm talking about deep inside and no one knew what we were going through God but you knew the whole time and I want to thank you and I want to praise you God for bringing us together as a family I want to thank the Lighthouse Baptist Church for opening up this facility and giving us the opportunity to meet here God and I just want to reflect I want to thank you for bringing sister Helen and I want to thank you for bringing um, newcomers here God and I just want to pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Cause your miracles to happen in our lives. Speak to us through your word and anoint us, God, that even we would leave here tonight so filled, God, so excited and so filled that by the time we go to bed, we will know that your spirit has ignited a fire in us, God, and we'll recall this prayer. God, fill us with your spirit so that we know it when we leave. And I would thank you and praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to be in 1 Peter. So we're going to finish our first book of Peter um, tonight. And it's been a journey through 1 Peter, through 1 Peter. We're in chapter 5 tonight, 1 through 11. So if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I just want to share, it's been a journey through Peter and I'm, my prayer is that we feel closer to Peter, that we feel Peter has a testimony too. And when you read these books together and you're anointed to, for Peter to be joining us, that we begin to feel like Peter, that Peter had a testimony too. Um, many of you know, and some of you may not, Peter was martyred at the end of his life. He was crucified like Jesus. And what Peter writes from his heart is a testimony much like these testimonies. And so my prayer is that by studying the books, we're going to know the authors and we're going to know God in a deeper way. Who do you know about Peter? What do you really know about him? The life, the times he rejected Jesus, the times that Peter fell down flat on his face, the times he was hurting, rejected, disowned Jesus three times, remembered that the Lord called him out before it happened, and then he became a powerful person and wrote a book. And Peter's writings are his heart. And I want to be closer to Peter. And you know what else blows my mind? Is that you're going to be with Peter soon. You're going to be standing with Peter. You're going to be next to Peter. And Peter's going to say, did you like my books? <laughs> did you enjoy reading them? Because I gave you everything that I had. I poured it all out for you. And we're going to conclude First Peter tonight. And I just want you to have the feeling of going. We went through the whole book together. That was our first book. So join me. First Peter 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour but resist him 
firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And that's the verse we had at the end of last week, remember? And there, there it was. I had pulled it up last week to pull uh, chapter 5 um, last week so we could see the confirm and perfect. So we're going to start in verse um, 1 through 4. Peter here gives three things that he requires of a pastor, an elder, and a church leader. So we're going to go through those three things to understand what Peter is saying in verse 1 through 4. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. <clears throat> okay. Peter outlines three things here for the qualities of a servant or a leader and a pastor mainly for pastors but in Peter's day they were just leaders like us they were ministry leaders they were people um, coming up in charge coming up in the ranks and leading the church the first thing Peter lays out in verse 2 he says uh, shepherd the flock of God among you exercising oversight not under compulsion but voluntarily the first thing Peter points out is laziness or slothiness. So Peter charges pastors and leaders to come out voluntarily, not under compulsion. Compulsion is somebody telling you that you have to do it, ordering you to do it, or compelling you to do it. We serve because we love Jesus Christ, not under compulsion. The second thing Peter lays out, and still in verse 2, he says, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain but with eagerness um, Peter lays out the second um, commandment for a pastor is that he is not to use money in any way or any way shape or form that is compulsive or greedy or in any way unethical number one voluntarily you should not have to be ordered or compelled to serve. You come voluntarily and willingly. Number two, you never mistake money or sordid gain or misuse money or show greed. It's forbidden in leadership in churches. The third thing Peter points out here is <clears throat> demagoguery. Demagoguery is pointed out... Um, right here in verse 3 nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge but proving to be examples to the flock we lead by example you are examples we are examples leadership pastors demagoguery is when someone is lording over you or um, it is described this way lording it over implies leadership by intimidation and or manipulation demagoguery to dominate someone and the main thing I want to point out is that um, we're always examples to the flock we lead and we teach and we live pastors should be examples how you study the word how you come into God how you praise how you worship how you're voluntarily willingly seeking Christ praising him worshiping serving him and you do not want to take part in lording over and you don't want to be in a place where you're being lorded over manipulated or some power that's put on you that's not how God leads and so if you ever run into that in a church Peter warns about this about lording over with intimidation or manipulation it's not the church of God 
So I want to look at a few scriptures here that are going to relate to um, serving willingly and being an example. <laughs> Isaiah 6, 8. Woe to those who add house to house and join field to field until there is no more room so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land. Isaiah 6, 8. Acts 20, 35. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord. Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Hebrews 6, 10 through 12. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. There's laziness or sluggish, and there's diligence, that each of you show the same diligence. God is encouraging us to serve and work hard. Mark 9.35 Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. You notice how Peter, when we really get to know Peter, one thing about Peter is he wanted us to be good. He always wanted us to be good. All through this book, he said, seek good, do good, and you will be blessed. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So there we have a list of scriptures. Peter's final words in chapter 5, encouraging pastors and church leaders against laziness, dishonest finance, and demagoguery. And we are to prove to be examples. You are to be an example, to teach and to live and to lead by example. And that's the most important thing in this set of Scripture. Going on to 5 through 7, humble ourselves and cast anxiety on Him. It gets a little deeper now. Verse 5, you younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. So as I began to study this, it got a little deeper. I'm going to try to relay some of the things I was getting revelation in this scripture. Casting all your cares on him. Peter tells us that this is the pathway to humility. And that was a bit of a revelation because I never understood that casting my cares on him had a lot to do with humility. And I was putting this together. Um, God was teaching me a lot for myself and to try to relay this to you. Humbling yourselves, admitting that all of your net mending. Remember, Peter was a fisherman. And Jesus said, cast your net, right? Cast your net over here. Admitting that all your net mending isn't doing anything to bring any more fish. Chuck it out there. Let your cares land upon him. Humbling yourself and casting your care. Casting your cares is the pathway to humility. It's a new revelation for me. You can trust God. And as you cast your care, don't ask why. And I'm going to tell you something that I learned about this. When you cast your cares on Jesus, for he cares for you, as we read the scripture, uh, another revelation came to me, and that is, you are 
Jesus' care. You're what he cares about. Think of the things that you care about. Your children, your life, your ministry functions, your, the, your home, where you're, what you're going to eat, where you're going to go, your parents, your family, your loved ones. You are Jesus' care. You're what he cares about. You're the only thing that he cares about. You're everything that he cares about. He's Jesus is sitting in heaven now making intercession for you because you and you alone and you are the very thing that he cares for. You are Jesus' care. He only cares about you and you and us. Everything that he lives for is to be with you forever in heaven. Everything that he did. You are Jesus' care. It's a powerful revelation. You're his mind, his heart, his care, his love. You're what he thinks about all the time. What are you thinking about? Your future, your career. Guess what Jesus is thinking about? You <laughs> and you alone and how you're going to be with him and how much he loves you and how he died for you and how he would do anything for you. How he st The Bible says he's standing in heaven now at the throne of God making intercession for you continually. This is your act of submission, surrender, sharing your troubles instead of pretending they don't exist. This is the pathway to humility. Make a net of your very own cares and anxieties. Make your own net. Mend your own net. Physically fill your net with all your worries and all your cares and fling it out there. Fling it out there on Jesus. Fling it out. Fling out your discontentment, your discouragement, your despair, and your suffering. Put it all in your net and cast it out there. When Jesus calls you to check your net you might find that the very things that entangled you may become a snare for blessing and sustenance in his hands cast them on him the things that were stuck in your mind so embedded in you that you were so worried about put them all in a net Fling them on Jesus, on his ocean of grace, and find out that everything that you cared about turn into sustenance and blessing in Jesus' hands. And when he calls you to check the net, you find out it's blessing and sustenance as a result. So I'm going to share with you some things um, that I'm not going to... I'm going to share two stories. One is, we've been reading a lot about Peter, and we've been reading about... Um, uh, don't be alarmed by the fiery trial that you're facing. Or we're all facing this together. So Mary Jane and I took our annual physical. And every year we take a blood test and a test. And we go annually to keep our insurance. So I went to take my annual physical this year. And the doctor sends me a note. And he says, um, your blood is high in one area. I'm like, what? This is just in the last two weeks. I said, oh boy, I better go read the Bible again, right? Like... Do not be surprised at the fiery trial. He says, you have to come back. So I come back and I take another test and he sends it in just last week and it comes back even higher. And so he says, you have to go see a specialist. I'm like, uh-oh. So I'm just sharing with you. Uh, it says, instead of pretending that our troubles don't exist, share them, cast them out. So I made an appointment with the specialist to find out why my count is high. And if it's low, you're fine. If it's high, there's something existing. It doesn't mean the presence of disease, but it doesn't mean the non-presence of disease. And so here I am casting my cares on Jesus. So just be in prayer for me. It takes a month and something to get to the specialist. It'll be December 11th until I can go. And so we will go find out. But in the meantime, Peter has greatly helped me. And that's what I want to share with you. Peter has been telling me for weeks. He's been telling us for weeks, put it in my hands. Put it in my hands. What can you do for one day to spare your life? What can you do to change one thing? 
I want to tell you another story about a man who, true story, I was in the lobby of my church years ago, and he came and sat next to me, and he had been diagnosed, and several people knew he was fairly popular. His wife served in a lot of ministries, and he said, can I talk to you? And he didn't know me, but he knew I was a minister. I said, sure. And he said, I've got only a couple months to live. And I said, what? And I said, let me pray for you. So I prayed with him, and he began to cry, and he began to weep right in the lobby, right here in Brentwood. And he told me, I should have served Jesus more. I should have done more for Jesus. And I just began to hug him, and he began to cry profusely. He was well up near his 70s. And he said, I should have done more. And I said, well, you're, you can still do it. You can still serve. Let's pray. And he told me, no, I should have done more. And he was uh, beating himself up. And I just hugged him and he cried and he was just weeping and crying. And I was just hugging him and I prayed for him and I comforted him saying, let's do something now. Let's do something for Jesus now. And he said, I should have done more when I had the time. And so these are real stories. These are real stories. We all have testimonies, right? And these testimonies will blow each other's minds. And I didn't know what to tell him. I just hugged him. And I said, you know, I could have said, yeah, that would have been a good idea. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, so we got to be real, right? And I just loved him and hugged him and comforted him, told him, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you more than anything. You're his child. You're his son. He loves you. He's not measuring you or judging you. But what he said, I think that changed my life. I was like eight years ago, and I've been serving ever since, you know, I've been serving my tail off. It changed my life. God sent a messenger to tell me I should have done more. And I'm like, whoo, I put the afterburners on. I told Mary Jane, we're going to start serving. We're going to get busy. And now I'm going to the doctor. And so it all just makes sense. But according to Peter, and so I want to share this. I have to be an example. We have to be examples. When God tells these boots to stop moving, these boots stop. It's over. And I'm happy with that. When these boots stop walking and God says it's time, then it's his time. And I'm happy with that. I'm content with the life that he's given me. I'm happy serving with you and loving you. You are Mary Jane and I. You're our family. And we love you. And we relish every single minute and every day, every salvation, every time, every word of the, of the word of God, every message, every song, every hope. We love you. And that's the bottom line. We are to be fervent in love for one another. So I'm, I'm being an example to you, and I know that when these shoes stop, it's because God says so, and I'm happy about that. And that's the way that it has to be. Okay, let's look at a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 12, 25. It's going to be good. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. <laughs> Thank you, God. Luke uh, 12, 24 through 26. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life's span? If you cannot even do a very little thing, then why do you worry about other matters? John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Amen? Amen. Psalm 55, 22. It's okay. Take your time, Jane. 55, 22. There's a good one. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. So whatever the blood count, Jesus, I need your help. You never allow us to be shaken. We are to be examples to each other and to the flock. And there's people that need to see you and they need to see you standing strong, trusting in the Lord. 
James 5, 4, 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Humility and casting your cares. I learned that casting your cares on God is the pathway to humility. So cast your cares on Jesus. Make a big net full and fling it out there and give it to him and watch it come back with blessing and sustenance. Amen? Amen. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> sustenance and blessing, vice versa, right? Blessing and sustenance and sustenance and blessing. So I'm really excited. I'm excited in the Lord and I'm excited to be here with you. And I'm excited for every day that God gives me. 8 through 11. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Being a Christian, although confident in God, we do not walk carelessly. The outside forces demand that Christians stay alert. Alert, resist the enemy, and wait on God. Waiting is not sitting down. Being a Christian means you are constantly fighting the devil. This is involving sinful urges, vulnerability, deadly thoughts, associations, and so on. Although it can be very exhausting, you do not do it alone. As a Christian, God is walking with you. Constantly fighting the devil. I don't know if that's something that we are learning in basic church or dare I say, if we're um, on milk. Being a Christian means constantly fighting the devil every day of your life. You need to know that. Be of sober spirit and be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The devil in Greek is slanderer. An adversary is legal opponent. So the devil is out to slander you and to be your legal opponent can catch you up in many ways. Thus, he is a malicious enemy who maligns believers and he and his forces are always working against you. That's not what they teach in come to Jesus, okay? You come to Jesus and get your salvation. That is the first and main priority for your life. It's the education you need from reading the books, from understanding Peter. Did Peter skip to Malu after he received Jesus? He's telling you that he suffered he had a hard life. He partook in the sufferings. And Peter was martyred and crucified. We just need to have the basic understanding from the Bible of what Christianity means. We have all the goodness, all the blessing, everything that Jesus gives us, salvation and life and life abundantly, protection from the evil one. Jesus said, keep them in the world, but protect them from evil. 
We have so many blessings, so much protection, going all the way back to that. Remember the story of the sinking vessel? The world is this sinking, stinking vessel, and all the people are stuck in the hole of the ship, and it's sinking fast, and where are they sinking to? Hell. But you've been picked up out of that sinking hole, and you're placed on the ship, walking around on the ship, completely saved. And you're able to reach the people that are stuck in the hole, billions of them. And they're sinking fast. And you're able to tell them, Jesus loves you. Jesus is the way. And you're walking on the vessel, and the vessel is... The vessel is sinking, and we call it earth. The vessel is earth. And there are billions of people stuck in the hole in darkness and they're sinking, going to hell. And that's how we opened up the book of Peter. We opened up Peter in chapter 1 with that story. And Peter tells you, you're going to suffer some. You're going to be a partaker in the suffering. You have to be alert. You have to be ready. You have to be on fire for God. You're going to be challenged. Don't be strangely alarmed at the fiery trials you're going through. You have to be ready. And again, we are the people who've been lifted up, saved. Are you completely saved? And you're going to heaven? And you're still on the vessel of earth, able to tell the people that are stuck, now look at your position. Where's our home? Heaven. My home is in heaven. And I get to stay here and tell some people about Jesus while the ship is sinking before I go to be with the Lord and jump off this sinking ship. And that happens when Jesus says so. The scripture says you can't add one more hour to your life. Why do you worry about such other things? Can't do it. We're being empowered. And Peter is empowering us. And I'm so excited to finish this book. Okay? Um, let's look at some scriptures. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen. <laughs> Psalm 119.9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. There's a young man that I told I have something for you and this is it. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to this word. Are you in the word? Are you studying the word? Are you ready to hear the word every week? Are you going to live by this word? You want your way to be pure? Or do you want it to be fouled up? Do you want young men to be messed up, fouled up, perverted in this world? Here's what the Bible says. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your, capital Y, God's word. And that is a message for you. James 4.7 Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Luke 4, 8. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. There's the scripture, Ken, that Ken used over the weekend. And I was telling him that God had just given me the same scripture. Remember, Ken? Destroying fortresses. Destruction of fortresses. Those are the strongholds in your mind that are keeping you from God. And this word will destroy those fortresses. There's something blocking you from receiving God. There's something blocking you from trusting God, receiving God, knowing God, desiring His word, and wanting to be with Him day and night with all your life and trusting Him and forgetting all your worries. There's something blocking you from doing that. And this word says we're going to remove the destructive fortresses. Those are the strongholds in the mind, destroying every speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and taking every thought captive to the obedience. Okay, we're going to close it out now with a few more scriptures. And I want to read the last verse here. Resist him 
firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Waiting on God. In the proper time, after you study, seek, love, worship, praise, fellowship, God will lift you up. Wait on God. Be alert. Resist the enemy. And wait on God. Galatians 5.5 5. For we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Hosea 12, 6. Therefore, return to your God. Observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. James 5, 7, and 8. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. God will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. First Peter 5, verse 10. God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you.